Hello, and welcome to Not Very Scary Stories. Tonight's episode will be more stories from around the internet. Tonight we have three stories. One is from a subreddit called r slash no sleep. Two are from a subreddit called r slash scary stories. Keep in mind these stories can be fiction or non-fiction, so I'll leave it up to you whether these are fake or true. Be sure to leave a sub, follow, or whatever you can on whatever platform you're on. Also, be sure to leave a review as well so people will know to listen in as well. I'd like to thank you guys for the support thus far on all platforms you can find us on, including YouTube. I'd also like to remind everyone that if you have any scary stories or experiences you'd like to share, email me at darkskygamenews at gmail.com and tell me how you'd like to be credited. I'm Zenith Darksky, and I'll be your host tonight. Enjoy. Our first story is posted by user slash horror story writer on r slash no sleep. The title is, I think the library is trying to send me a message. My name is Kevin, and I'm a 20 year old college student. I attend a small public university in the Midwest. For privacy's sake, I won't be saying exactly which university I attend. Like most students, I spend lots of time in the large university library, working on homework and various projects. It has become a routine for me, and it is often comforting during these times of intense stress. One particular night, I was on the upper floor of the library, working while I watched the moon slowly rise on the horizon. Late nights at the library were the norm for me, as the old building is usually quiet and most importantly, empty. There's something about being alone in the library, listening to the quiet jazz purring from the speakers that calms me. Last night, however, my routine was interrupted when I saw something written on the far wall bathed in moonlight. From where I sat at my wooden table, the message was too small to read. After squinting at it unsuccessfully, I stood up and walked across the room. Being closer, the message was easily readable, and my heart jumped when my eyes fell across the dark letters written in permanent marker. Get out, read the words. Taken aback, I looked up and down the wall trying to find another message. Being unsuccessful, I slowly walked around the room, scouring the walls, failing to find anything. I sat back down on my seat, probably some bored college kid. I thought to myself, pushing the experience out of my mind, I got back to work. Half an hour or so passed, with the message all but forgotten. During this time, the night janitor arrived. He immediately went to the trash room, which was a small closet in the room next to mine. I could hear him humming to himself as he closed the door. The sounds of him breaking down cardboard boxes filled the room. Annoyed, I gathered my things. Time to find a different table, I thought to myself. After slipping on my backpack, I shuffled down the stairs to the ground floor, seating myself at a wooden desk. I unpacked my laptop and study materials. I should note that my new workspace was next to a large rectangular window. Looking through the window during the daytime, one could see carefree college students playing frisbee in the courtyard or freshmen flirting with seniors under the white oak trees. At night, however, all I could see was the dark lawn, with the only light coming from the large moon overhead. This is nice, I thought to myself. Maybe I should come here more often. As I looked out over the yard, my eyes caught something in the trees. It looked humanoid, but it was too far away to clearly see in the darkness. Something about it just seemed wrong. With a growing sense of dread, I stood up. Stepping closer to the window and pressing my face against the cold glass, I peered towards the dark tree line where I'd seen the figure. This time, however, I couldn't see anything. As I pulled my face away from the window, my eyes focused on the glass itself, and I saw something. Another message, I thought to myself. 
This one looked as though it had been drawn by a finger over the frost of the window and was much more difficult to read than the first. It simply read, Get out now. Freaking out, I turned to pick up my stuff and get the hell out of this place. When I turned, however, I saw a man standing by the window outside. He looked like an average man, average height, average winter clothes, and so on. He was standing against the wall by the window. So if I was just looking through the window, I would not have been able to see him. Strangely, he was facing the wall of the building and was so close that his nose was pushed to the side by the brick exterior. But his eyes... He was staring at me. His pupils were pushed as far to the left as possible so that he could see me while still having his face pointed towards the wall. As I looked at him, I could see that the corner of his mouth that was on my side was slowly curling upwards, continuing past what was physically possible. The corner of his mouth reached his left eye and kept going. That was it for me. I let out a gasp and fled, leaving my study materials and phone. Sprinting to the back door of the library, I realized that it was kept locked. Only the employees had the key. Cursing, I tried it anyway. To my surprise, the door opened, letting in a rush of cold night air. Having left my coat at the desk, I shivered as I charged out into the blackness. I only live a few blocks from the library. I think I set a sprinting world record on the way home. My door was locked, but I thanked every god I could name that I kept a key in my pocket, not my backpack. I threw open the door and looked behind me one more time, expecting to see the man, seeing no one in the inky blackness of my street. I slammed the door shut and locked it. Then I went around my apartment and locked every window, ending up in my bedroom and locking that door as well. Cursing myself for leaving my phone at the library, I was unable to call the police. I decided I would go back there first thing in the morning to collect my things, not realizing that the decision would be taken out of my hands. The next morning, I awoke to flashing red and blue lights blinking through my bedroom window, accompanied by a loud banging on the door. Police! uttered a gruff voice. As the memories of last night flooded into my mind, I quickly threw back my covers and placed my feet on the floor. The officer I opened the door was an unsmiling middle-aged man. His partner stood a few paces behind him. Sir, I'm going to need you to come with us. There's been an incident at the library and we believe that you have information we need. I... I was at the last... the library last night, but I... Did. Yes, you were. Sir, you have to come with us right now, the officer repeated. Shaking, I stepped outside and closed my door. The ride to the police station was nerve-wracking. The officer told me that I wasn't in trouble. I just had to answer a few questions. My handcuff-free hands lent credence to these words. Once the patrol car arrived at the station, the first officer took me inside while the second one drove off. I was led straight into an interrogation room. Look, I've seen a lot of crime TV shows, and this interrogation room was exactly what I expected. Dim lights, metal table with cuffs laying on it, and one chair on either side. A mirror that I knew was see-through from the other side. This room fit all the criteria. The officer ordered me to sit at the chair opposite the mirror. I did as I was told, but I didn't understand why I was in the interrogation room if I wasn't in trouble. I sat there for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Time was hard to discern for me at the moment. After that time passed, a small metal door opened and two people walked in. A female cop and a man who I assumed to be a detective. The detective who was carrying a slim manila folder took the seat across from me. The officer stayed standing by the door, her arms folded as she frowned at me. Laying the folder on the table, the man introduced himself to me. My name is Detective Cross. Specifically, I focus on homicides. Do you know what a homicide is, Kevin? He smirked without waiting for a response. He continued, Kevin, where were you last night? My heart froze. I stammered out something unintelligible, and he frowned. Kevin, I don't speak Mandarin. Tell me in plain English where you were last night. I'm doing my best to work with you here, but if you don't help me out, then I'll just have to assume I was at the library. I blurted it out. Looking annoyed, Detective Cross opened his mouth to respond, but I rambled on, the words spilling out of my mouth uncontrollably. I was working. 
and I saw a man and he was staring at me and I ran home and then shut up. Your lucky security footage corroborates your story as that outburst didn't inspire any confidence in your honesty for me. Cross broke in. I'm going to ask you some more questions and I need you to calm down before I can continue. Can you do that for me, Kevin? Cross asked again, his gaze softening. I... Yes, I told him, taking several deep breaths. After watching me for a few moments, he continued. What happened at the library last night? Take your time. I stood up a bit straighter, my eyes glazing over momentarily. Taking a deep breath, I reminded myself to talk slowly. I told Detective Cross everything that had happened since I arrived at the library. I described changing workspaces, the messages, and the man. When I was finished, Cross rubbed his forehead with his fingers, wiping the sweat that he had accumulated on his sleeve. He looked satisfied, as if he had just solved a difficult puzzle. Kevin, the night janitor you mentioned, do you remember when he arrived? Cross questioned. I didn't know the exact time the janitor arrived, but I gave him my estimation. Cross turned towards the officer and they exchanged a look. He then looked back at me. The night janitor was killed last night, Kevin. His body was found in the trash room you described. His manner of death was disturbing. You know what? Take a look. It might help you remember anything else you may have forgotten. He slid the manila folder across the table and gestured for me to open it. With shaking hands, I turned the cover and found several photos clipped together. I took them out and unclipped them, spreading the Polaroids across the table. To this day, I wish I ignored my morbid curiosity and refused to look. Some part of me wanted to just close the folder, but I couldn't. I had to see what happened to the man I had just seen the day before. Looking at the crime scene photos made me physically ill. I had to run to the nearest bathroom, which was unfortunately the women's room. After vomiting several times, I washed my face and, with shaking legs, staggered back into the interrogation room. Small disclosure, if you have a weak stomach, skip the next 20 seconds of this recording. I would not wish the images I was forced to view be forced onto anyone else. His body had been stuffed into the corner of the trash room, and when I say he had been stuffed, I mean that his body had been crumpled into a ball smaller than what I had thought possible. One arm was missing, while the other was wrapped around his body three or four times. His knees were both bent backwards, and their respective feet were touching the man's head. His face was the worst, however. His mouth hung open, slightly tilted to one side. His tongue was engorged and sticking out of his mouth. Had I been deaf... I'd have assumed a tortured scream was emitting from his destroyed body. His eyes were completely white, something I, to this day, can't figure out how it happened. It took me a full 20 minutes to view and process every picture. Each one was worse than the last. Detective Cross slowly nodded at my reaction, albeit with a bored expression on his face. He bore the look of a man who had seen things like this far too often. Though the exact specifics of the janitor's death were probably relatively unique. Since I knew no other information, I was allowed to leave shortly after. I was given a ride back to my apartment by the same officer who had taken me to the station. The last few weeks have been rough. Ever since that night, I've refused to go to the library and I rarely leave my house. I am terrified that I'll see that man again. From watching the news, I know the police never found him. They assure me that I'm safe, but I don't know. My fears were confirmed when I arrived home tonight after grabbing some fast food for dinner. As I set down the bag in the coffee table, I noticed my library card sitting to the left of the bag. The feeling of dread that had filled me weeks ago returned, and with trembling hands, I turned it over. Get out. This next story was posted by user slash acrobatic blue j eighty three on r slash scary stories. The man in the forest is the title. The man in the forest. I have lived in my house since I was born, and I have never noticed anything strange. However, two weeks before we were planning to move out, 
I experienced something that chills me to this day. It was a normal day. I remember chilling on my bed watching Minecraft or something. My mom and dad called upstairs to tell me they were going to the gym. This was normal as they were very athletic unlike me who was a bit of a slob. Anyway, I called out goodbye and I heard the door shut from my room and my parents chatting in the garden through my open window. I heard my garage door close and the car drive away. I wasn't too worried about robbers or strange people outside my house as I lived on a fairly busy road with old residents. However, on this afternoon my road was barren. I went back to watching my iPad when my parents left. Then I had the urge for some food. I went down the stairs to my kitchen, which had French doors and many windows overlooking a thick forest behind my house. I didn't notice anything outside and got some crisps and a glass of orange juice. I had brought my iPad with me, but I didn't have enough hands to carry it all up, so I grabbed my food and went back upstairs, checking before I went up the tree line behind my fence. When I put my crisps and juice on the bedside table, I went back down for my iPad. When I reached the kitchen, something happened that would haunt me forever. There was a horrifying face in the trees just beyond my fence. As I remember, it had an eerie smile and a glowing white face, but that was all I could make out. I quickly ran upstairs, too scared to remember my iPad. When I reached my room, which was the highest in the house, I looked out my window to see a white-faced figure sprinting towards my house. My face froze, and I remember wondering if I had locked the door. Then, a click as the French doors to my kitchen creaked open. I could hear it clearly even from a couple floors up. I could make out faint shuffling of heavy footsteps on my kitchen floor. I did a silent cry and my throat felt dry. I slowly crept to the edge of my stairs so I see the bottom of the stairs. I hear a frantic grunt and quick footsteps along the tiled floor and a transition onto the wooden stairs. The footsteps got louder and my breath quicker. And then I heard the door of my brother's room, which was two floors below mine, open. The hinges whined and the figure grunted in frustration as my brother was not in it and slammed the door shut. It all gets vivid from this point. I heard the figure stop back down the stairs and the door to the garden click shut. However, when I looked out my window, there was no one leaving. I told my parents when they got home, they passed it off as a vision or something, but I could tell they were troubled as they moved the moving day to a nearer date and bought me a phone for emergencies. I would have been troubled till now. I've been troubled to now, and even in my new house, I am worried about the trees behind my house. Who was the man in the forest? This next story is titled, I Saw My Mom, posted by user slash QLOBY013 on r slash scary stories. This took place a couple of months ago. I had just finished taking a shower and it was about 6 p.m. The shower upstairs is broken so my family uses the one in the basement bathroom instead and I was coming up the stairs when I saw my mom walk past the stairwell. She was moving so I didn't get a very good look at her. I greeted her as I kept ascending the stairs but she didn't answer me. This isn't unusual for my mom as she sometimes struggles with hearing. When I reached the top of the stairs I watched her turn into the kitchen. 6 p.m. is pretty early for me to take a shower, so I figured I would let her know I was done in case she wanted to take hers. I went into the kitchen and my mom was just standing there, looking out the glass door leading out into our backyard. Usually there is still light from outdoors at 6 p.m., but this was during the fall, so it was fairly dark outside, and I couldn't see exactly what she was looking at. I didn't think anything of this as she had a habit of looking at the neighbor's dog or the moon when it's out. So I just told her I had finished my shower, no answer. Again she has trouble hearing so I repeated myself louder this time. This time I got an answer. It was my mom's voice but it was coming from down the hall. A chill ran down my spine and I called out to my mom asking where she was. 
She didn't answer at first, so I repeated myself. She answered, sounding annoyed, but her voice was still coming from the hall. She said she was in her room, which was located down said hall. My mom, standing at the back door, had not moved or even acknowledged this exchange. I was frozen to the spot, petrified. If my mom was down the hall, then what well, was standing right in front of me? I examined my mom, since my body wouldn't move to run away. She, it, looked just like my mom, but as I looked closer, I noticed some things were off. Her arms were just a little bit too long, nearly reaching her knees. Her skin was pale, nearly matching the grayish-white color of the sleeping gown she wears casually around the house. Her hair looked just a bit more coarse than it usually is. I couldn't see her reflection in the glass door. Then my mom started to move. Moving oh so slowly, it began to turn towards me, and I was finally able to move, bolting down the hallway to my mom's room. Sure enough, my mom was in there. She at first found it amusing that I looked so panicked. I'm scared of the dark, so she figured I was just spooked that the light in the hallway was turned off. She irritably agreed to come look in the kitchen when I begged her. I told her there was something in there that looked like her. She thought I was crazy, even more so when we got to the kitchen and found it empty. She then thought I was just trying to scare her, which I do have a habit of doing, but I swore I wasn't lying. She didn't believe me. I couldn't really fall asleep that night. Those long arms and pale skin had embedded themselves in my mind's eye and I couldn't shake the feeling that somewhere in the darkened window of the room, two piercing eyes were watching me, waiting for me to slip into unconsciousness.